and welcome to module 5 of our series on playing golf croquet. In this module we're going to be looking at handicap play. Now so far in all the modules we've assumed that all the players are of equal standards and of course that is not the case. There's a huge disparity in people between the world champion and a beginner and so to even things out we have a handicap system and so in golf croquet this works by giving people what are known as extra strokes. They used to be called extra turns and ironically enough many people call them bisques. Now a, a bisque is a term from association croquet which means something quite different in a way insofar as it's a much more powerful uh, version of, uh, uh, of an extra turn than we have in golf croquet. But um, in trying to make things simple by calling them what they are, extra strokes, people find that a bit of a mouthful and so they've reverted to the association croquet terminology. When a person starts to play golf croquet, a club handicapper will give him or her an initial handicap. For an absolute beginner it will be 16. Because the, the handicap range runs from minus 6, which is world champion standard, to 20, which is uh, the absolute beginner um, minus a few just for somewhere to go to when you lose your first few matches. And if someone starts at say 16, every time they win or lose a match, 10 points is added to his or her index. Now the index is an, uh, an arbitrary number and at 16 it is a thousand, so if uh, at 16 you win your first match, you add 10 points to your index, so your index becomes 1010. If you lose, then it becomes 990. And that system goes on and on for as long as you play golf croquet. And you keep a record of your uh, matches and their scores on your handicap card like this. And for golf croquet, the handicap card is green, for association croquet it's white and the two forms of croquet basically use the same handicap system but of course they're counted separately. There is another form of play called level play in which no handicap applies and so people play simply as they are. Level play is really best used for people who have a very similar handicap and is often used in major tournaments or perhaps inter club leagues and so on. But generally speaking it's better if people play handicap rather than level because then the, the system will allow their shortcomings to be taken care of. Now when you're playing handicap play, uh, Charmian is 11, 11, David is 12 and so there's one step difference between them and in order to show that th that, that step is actually going to be used at some point, David will have an extra stroke at some point in a game, he will have in his pocket some sort of a counter like this. In this club we use poker chips, other clubs that use all sorts of different things but you really do need something that you can hand over to your opponent uh, at the time that you're going to take the extra stroke and you can take the extra stroke after any uh, normal turn. Now the poker chips are fine if you're only handing over say half a dozen or so but when it comes to handing over large numbers and if I were playing Dave I would be giving him 14 extra turns, extra strokes, and the poker chips actually become just a, a big weight in your pocket. So I use tuppenny pieces which are easily replaced and uh, then Dave can put them in his pocket and as he uses them give one back to me for every time he's taken an extra turn. It's important that no matter how many extra strokes you're giving, whether it be 1 or 14, you must use the tokens so that there's no danger of uh, forgetting or uh, claiming that you've had an extra stroke when you haven't or whatever. Always use some sort of, of token to hand over so that both sides have a clear indication of how many tokens have been used, how many extra strokes have been used and, and how many remain. In the doubles game there is another change in the handicap uh, allocation rules with the fifth edition. Uh, now the lowest handicapper on one side is compared with the highest handicapper on the other and 
appropriate extra turns given uh, divided by two because it's doubles. So on this side, Dave is 12, Charmian is 11, and Keir is 7, and Warwick is 10. Dave is compared with Keir, and Charmian is compared with Warwick. So Keir's handicap is 7, Dave's is 12, a difference of 5. For doubles, that's divided by 2, which gives 2.5. And because you can't have half an extra turn, um, Dave's two and a half is rounded up to three. So he gets three extra turns. Charmian is 11, Warwick is 10. So the difference is one. But again, you can't have uh, half an extra turn. So Charmian is given also um, one extra turn. Now, the thing is that both these players have been given an extra half an extra turn. So they would have, if, they, if that was allowed, to have an, a whole extra turn between them. They, you can't actually do that. So one of them chooses not to have the half extra turn. And it's up to them to decide which one it is. So whether it's Dave or Charmian, Charmian would have no extra turns. and Dave would keep his three or Dave would go down to two and Charmian would keep her one. It's up to them to decide. So what are you going to do, folks? Uh, we'll ha I'll have one, if you don't mind, because it gives us so, more versatility. Thanks. There we are. So the system works in I itself out. It's important to remember that in doubles, extra strokes can only be taken by the person that they're allocated to. They are not there for either player to use. So, we've looked at allocation of uh, extra turns. How do we go about use, using them? Well, broadly speaking, the uh, possible uses of extra turns falls into three categories, depending on how many extra turns are being given and received. If you're giving or receiving three or fewer extra turns, it means that the two players are of a similar standard and that you should be able to, if you're receiving the extra turns, you should be able to hold your own throughout much of the game. So therefore, use the few extra turns that you've got in killer spots. For example, on one or two of the later long hoops, perhaps on hoops uh, eight and nine, or nine and 10, and certainly, if it goes that far, to hoop 13. Keep one in your pocket for hoop 13, but, don't lose the game at hoops 11 or 12 if you've still got an extra turn in your pocket. If you're giving, say, between, or receiving, between four and eight extra turns, it means there's a, a bit of a disparity between the players and that you should therefore look at using the extra turns uh, th almost throughout the game. And don't think that you should keep them right to the end. That can be fatal because you may have lost the game by then. So use them to to create attacking advantage on the longer hoops and starting right at the very beginning of the game. Hoop one is, is 21 yards from corner four and if you can put a ball straight in front of hoop one using an extra turn, that's quite a big ask for someone when they possibly haven't quite got their eye in. And similarly, if you uh, lose hoop one, then with your first ball, go down to hoop two and put your ball straight in front of the hoop. Similarly on hoops three and four, and then on hoops eight, nine, and 10. So create advantage on the long hoops by getting close to the hoop and then putting your ball in a very difficult place for your opponent to hit away. Because what you're doing is forcing your opponent to play a shot that he doesn't want to play. Your opponent would much rather play up to the hoop with a nice approach shot, put his ball straight in front of the hoop. He doesn't really want to be, have to be shooting at your balls because the chances are that he'll miss and end up out of position. So force him to do things that he doesn't want to do. If you've got nine or more extra turns, you are in potentially a strong position if you have got the ability to hit balls away hard and fast. And 
uh, if you can do that, you can spare to use at least one extra turn on virtually every hoop of the game. So if your opponent, uh, who's going to be much better than you, gets a ball in front of the hoop, get up to that ball with one turn and then using an extra turn, hit a ball away, which creates a lot of problems in terms of rebuilding up a position to run the hoop again. So you've got the opportunity to take control of the game to some extent and you can ma manipulate your much better opponent than you, better than you might think actually. I hope it goes without saying that on an extra turn you continue using the same ball that you've used in the normal turn. If perchance you should play a wrong ball on an extra turn shot then replace and replay applies. So in other words, if you've played um, the, 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 a wrong ball with your extra turn, you put it back and then play the correct ball. Before playing an extra turn, you must give a clear indication to your opponent that you are going to do so. Now the rules say that you can give that indication before playing your normal turn or immediately afterwards. Personally, I think it's best if people do not say anything before they play their normal turn. Wait to see how that turn transpires and make a decision on the basis of where the balls lie after the normal turn before taking the extra stroke. Because if you announce to your opponent that you're likely to take an extra stroke before your normal stroke, psychologically there is almost an, uh, a requirement it's not real, but it's psychological to go on and take that extra, extra stroke. And I think it's far better just to play your turn, see how, what happens, and then indicate to, the, to your opponent that you're going to take an extra stroke. And I, although the rules don't say this, personally, I think it's best to use the association croquet system of indicating uh, what would be a biscuit AC uh, to put your hand up. Then it's quite clear that you are going to do something different and it forestalls the opponent from playing. If your opponent plays before you have indicated that you are going to take a, an extra stroke, then you should forestall the opponent and then take your extra st stroke, then he replays the shot that he would have otherwise taken. You can also take an extra turn if you've committed a fault, but if in that particular case you decide to play an extra turn, the balls must be put back into the place where they were before the fault was committed, rather than at the situation where you've played a fault, the balls have gone somewhere else, and then you take an extra turn. You may not do that. Taking an extra turn means putting the balls back and taking it from there. If you decide to take an extra stroke, you can change your mind and say, no, after all, I'm not going to take an extra stroke. But if you say to your opponent, I'm not going to take an extra stroke, you may not then change your mind in favor of taking one. So we've had a look at how extra strokes are allocated. And if I'm going to play Keir, who's a seven, he would get nine extra strokes. So there, those are his nine counters. Mm -hmm. and so we're now going to have a little look at how to use them to best effect. And generally speaking, you should use them to attack rather than to defend. And we'll show you some examples of how to do that. So Keir has won the toss, and so he's going to play his blue ball across to hoop one. As you can see, that was really quite a nice shot, but he's not in a hoop running position. So Keir can now take an extra stroke, or play an extra stroke, and try and get his ball into the hoop. And it's worth noticing also that this hoop, as many others do, has a little rabbit run. And if you can get your ball into a rabbit run, it will sit there quite comfortably, and it's very difficult to get it out. Thank you, Keir. Keir has got his ball quite nicely uh, and tight on the hoop, which makes it very difficult for the next player to hit away. I'll go and have a go.
as you saw I missed not by very much but it was a miss and of course I would have another go with my yellow so Keir is very nicely placed both to get his ball through this hoop and actually with a good hit to get it right the way down to hoop two so we'll let him have a go at that as well So now Keir can think about taking another extra turn and putting his ball straight in front of hoop two because my balls are still on the other side of hoop one which is a long way away and of course he can take as many extra, extra turns one after the other as he, as he wishes um, until he's run out of what he's got but of course normally it's n no point in taking more than one or two at a time. As you can see, Kerr's put his ball into the hoop. It's actually beginning to run the hoop. A very powerful position. Uh, to all intents and purposes, it's impossible for the opponent to hit that away. Uh, so Kerr has effectively scored another hoop. One important fact to note about extra stroke turns is that you may not score a point for your own side. So if you're trying to put a ball uh, close to or into a hoop and it runs through the hoop, then that point does not count. Uh, but of course you could take another extra stroke and pop your ball back onto the live side of the hoop for the next turn. Conversely, if you accidentally put your opponent's ball through a hoop in an extra stroke turn, you will score a point for your opponent. So you need to be careful when you're operating close to hoops with extra strokes. But of course you can be 99% of the way through a hoop without actually having run it. So getting your ball into the jaws and part way through the hoop is actually quite a good idea. So is there any counter to the extra shot turn where a ball has been put directly in front of a hoop? Here we are at hoop 10 and the blue ball is straight in front of the hoop. So this is hoop nine, and by slight serendipity, my two balls, the red and the yellow, have ended up more or less in line, pointing down towards hoop 10. So I can promote the yellow ball with the red in order to get the yellow down towards that ball which is in front of hoop 10. So now, of course, it would be Black's turn to play, uh, but Black is still up by hoop nine. And when it comes to Yellow's turn, Yellow has the choice of either snicking Blue out of the way or even trying a jump shot at the hoop. The safer thing is actually just to nick Blue and get it out of the way of the hoop. Uh, if you miss the jump shot, you've given Blue the hoop. So that was slightly fortunate that my balls happened to be lined up. Let's just have a look at another similar situation where the balls may not be quite so conveniently placed. We'll put the blue ball back in front of hoop 10, but this time the red and the yellow will be further apart. So this time the red and the yellow are not quite so conveniently placed for a good rush down to hoop 10, but by promoting the yellow with the red I can get it first of all closer to the hoop to make the next shot with the yellow easier and also perhaps give me an angle which will be able I'll be able to hit the the blue away more easily at the moment they're in a dead straight line and very difficult to hit away So this time, yellow is not quite so handy for hitting the blue away, but I still feel reasonably confident about getting that shot. So at least I've removed the danger there 
Blue will now have to play, of course, and the other balls follow on in sequence. And more particularly, in a way, I've uh, managed to negate one of the extra shots that my opponent has. So I then put myself back in contention again. Not all promotions need to be of that long range variety. Here we are at hoop six, and it's uh, red to play, red, but neither of my balls, red or yellow, has in any way got a hoop shot. Black and blue are quite difficult, but I can promote my yellow ball again with the red and hopefully get both balls in front of the hoop. Now with that single shot, I've done several things. I've got both of my balls in a hoop running position and my yellow has also blocked the putative shot of black at the hoop. And that's a good example of how you can make one shot do more than one thing. Making the, the possible hoop shots with my balls, but blocking the opponent. And blocking shots are a good alternative to hitting balls away. Here we are still at hoop six. It's red to play. Red cannot run the hoop. Black could run the hoop. And I could hit black away, but my ball would also then not have a hoop running chance. So I can block black's path to the, to the hoop. Red is just blocking black's route. If black were to try for the hoop, he would just clip the edge of red. And when you're trying to block a ball, it's best to play up as close as possible to the ball that you're trying to block. Because anywhere in that triangle would block black's progress to the hoop. If you try and play straight across the line, you don't have very much room for error. It's just like when we looked at running balls across the face of the hoop. Play up close and then you give yourself a reasonable chance. We've looked at examples of how to use extra strokes to attack. Here is one uh, using an extra stroke to defend. Both Kier's balls are, are, are on the playing side of the hoop. This is hoop six, but my red ball is in the hoop and ready to run it. So Kier really needs to get that ball out. And he's not terribly keen on jumping, so he's going to show us how to do a defensive extra stroke shot. So Keir uh, managed to get his black ball through the hoop backwards, so he now has two balls on the playing side of the hoop. My red ball is well down the lawn and my yellow ball is slightly wired from both of his black balls, so he's put himself into a very powerful position with that extra stroke. So how does the handicap system work in practice? This is a table which is available on the CA website and which should be given in hard copy format to everyone with their handicap card. Let us say that a person is given an initial handicap of 14, 1050. If he wins a game playing handicap, he gains an extra 10 points on his index and so will go to 1060. If he wins five net games, he may lose one or two in the meantime, but if he wins five net games, his index will increase to 1100, so his handicap will change to 12. And at that point, his club handicapper should sign off his handicap card on the front to say that the change has happened and date it. Our player may then win another game and his index would increase to 11.10. He may then lose a couple of games and slip back to 1.090. But his handicap does not change back to 14. It would only go back to 14 if he were to lose five net games and so that his index would decrease back to 1.050. 
So he has a period of grace between the two trigger points where he may be below the uh, trigger point for 12 but still be a handicap 12. But hopefully he will carry on winning net games and so improve his handicap. As his index increases so his handicap goes down. And when you're winning and losing 50% of your handicap games you know that that is your correct handicap but there's always going to be some fluctuation between various handicap levels. When you get to handicap 6 life becomes a little, little bit more difficult because in order to go down another step down to 5 you need to win 10 net games and that carries on until you get down to a handicap of minus 2 when it becomes even more difficult because you need to win 15 net games in order to go down to minus 3. Things are a little more complicated when we are playing level play. In this case we need to use this larger table and let us say that someone with a handicap of 4 is again playing another person with a handicap of 4 and whoever wins they would win or lose 10 points and the, the, the point of that of course is that 10 is the uh, number of points that you would lose or win in a handicap game because extra turns equilibrate the difference between the two players in other situations. So let us say that our four player was now playing a person of handicap one. If he were to win, and this is the winner's handicap down this side, if he were to win he would gain 16 extra points and the handicap one player, and this is the loser's handicap, the handicap one player would lose 16 points. So in, in level play you can win and lose quite a lot of points very quickly. Now if conversely the handicap one player were to win and the handicap four player were to lose then only four points would be exchanged. So the handicap one player would get four points and the handicap four player would only lose four points. And then there are large areas of the table, at top and bottom, where if a weak player lost to a strong player, he would only lose one point, and the strong player would only gain one point, which is as it should be. If, on the other hand, the weak player were to win, he would gain 19 points, and the strong player would lose 19 points. So in level play, life can get very difficult very quickly if you are a strong player and lose to a weaker player. All of these changes should be recorded on your handicap card. And on the front of it is a, a broad record of the handicap changes over a period of time, signed off by a club handicapper. And I keep all my handicap cards together with copies of the rules for both AC and GC in a plastic wallet which you can get from uh, High Street Stationers and it just keeps everything neat and tidy. Inside the card should be a record of all the games that you play other than casual games such as in club mix-ins and it's set out quite clearly so here we are on the 24th of August 2019 I played Alan Clark, so put the full name, just not just Alan, but the full name. His handicap, which was a 14. Whether the game was handicap or level, this was a handicap game, so I was giving him extra strokes. And then the result, and this was...